When you dare to share, you break the silence. When you dare to share, you speak your truth. When you dare to share, you use the full strength of your voice. When you dare to share, it brings opportunity to own your story. So tell it, be heard, and at the same time, your sharing is someone else's learning, inspiration, motivation, empowerment, and hope. There's always an element to each of our stories that remains a secret. For some, we feel it's a dirty little secret. Dare to Share Your Untold Story exposes these secrets in a welcoming and positive way. I encourage each of you out there to dare yourself to share what is yours to tell. When we dare, it is the courage to do something really important. Let this be a vow to each and every single one of us that we take risk, we brave, confront, and face what is, while inspiring and empowering all communities. So let's break that silence and tap into mental beauty. This is Salima Jadavji, your podcast host, a practicing clinical social worker, and your mental wellness connoisseur. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast, episode number 34, The Devastation and Stigma of a Parent's Divorce and the Unknown Mental Health Crisis. To all my fellow listeners, before we get started, I'm just dropping in a note to give you a heads up that this podcast might be emotionally triggering for you. We do invite guests onto the show who share openly about extremely difficult life moments with exposure and impact of what the struggles have been like. The intensity of each episode could have a variable impact on your emotional and mental well-being based on your own personal story. If at any point the topic becomes uncomfortable or upsetting to you in any way, please do not pressure yourself to listen. Instead, be kind to yourself do some self-care, and perhaps give another episode a try. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our amazing and daring guest, Christine Yarrell. Christine has been a valued member of the LifeWorks by Morneau Chappelle team since 2002 in both client-facing and people leadership roles. She currently holds the role of Director, Public Safety Development, focused on the needs of the first responder sector. She has served over 19 years in the organization, ensuring the LifeWorks services meets employers' needs. Her clients have included some of Canada's largest unionized employers. In her role, Christine brings her ability to engage wellness and leadership stakeholders, problem-solve, educate, and build trusting relationships. This includes oversight of program design, implementation and management, communications, and recommendations for prevention strategies. She develops strong partnerships with prospective clients and stakeholders, delivers constructive evaluations of programs, and demonstrates the positive impact of LifeWorks services for members and employees. Christine is the creator, producer, and co-writer of Heartbeat webinar series, LifeWorks, by Morneau Chappelle's monthly client-facing talk radio-style education and sales webinar series, delivering content to organizational leaders on human resource content, including mental health. She is the winner of four Employee Assistance Society of North America Corporate Awards of Excellence for her work with Peel Regional Police in 2014, Ontario Power Generation, both 2011 and 2018, Atomic Energy of Canada, 2012. Well, well, well. Hello, Christine. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast. Thank you very much, Salima. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh my goodness. Christine, I'm just looking forward to have this chat with you today. I am pumped and ready to go to chat about all things daring, all things deep. And you know, I'm really excited and um, actually really grateful that you are on this platform with me with full willingness to share and be open uh, to talk about something that often doesn't get spoken about. So I really appreciate your support for taking this stance with me to help break down barriers of mental stigma. Well, thanks for having me. I wouldn't say anybody in my life would describe me as a daredevil, but today I'm going to take that moniker. Today you are a daredevil. I love it. (laughs) So Christine, in case you're still wondering, With this podcast, it's about bringing forward untold stories that people go through, whether it's directly about a mental health struggle or not. Uh, One thing that we know is that there is always impact to someone's mental health. 
Um, and that's the part of their story that usually really uh, typically remains uh, tucked away. So the purpose of this platform was meant to, or is meant to serve as a way to break barriers of mental stigma that have been conditioned in our society. So the aim here, my quest is our conversation today, the presence of us coming together and having this chat, uh, this conversation is really to encourage people to come forward, to share and tell what people typically don't want to unveil that they keep tucked away and, and don't express. And of course, I'm bringing forward a new trend. It's called the mental beauty rethink. What do you think about the mental beauty rethink? I think that's an interesting idea. I, I don't think many people think of their mental health as something that's beautiful. You know, people talk about their mental health when mm -hmm. when it's in a bad place. You know, it's a wilted flower in the garden and people are not feeling their best. But, uh, you know, with a little care, the, all things come back to life. So I like the idea of mental beauty. Oh, that's great. I really like uh, how you how you said that, um, you know, people sometimes only think about mental health when it's you know a negative state. So uh, it's true. And I think it's about embrace. For me, it's about embracing um, all parts of health, physical health, mental health, but also embracing you know, the good, bad and ugly as all part of it being beautiful because, you know, life is imperfect and things are imperfect, but, you know, it can still be beautiful. Yeah. And I think all those parts are, are equally important, right? If one's out of balance, the rest are, are not in a good place either. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So I'm ready to get down to all my questions. How about you? Sounds good. I'm feeling daring. I love it, Miss Daredevil. Miss Daredevil Christine, give us the newspaper headline of how you would title your untold story. What would it say? I think it would say uh, depression isn't a place, it's a journey. Depression isn't a place, it's a journey. Okay. I think sometimes people think that, uh, you know, if they struggle with depression, that that's uh, a, a permanent state of mind or it's a... Um, a lifelong sentence that they're going to struggle with their entire life. And that's, that's not really my experience of it. Mm -hmm. It's more like a place I visit from time to time. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting way of saying, you know, it's something that you visit from time to time. I'm going to use that in my client sessions. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think like any journey, there's, there's an element of choice in it. Um, but there's also an element in, I, I find it helpful thinking of of the journey as I, I choose the directions too. So I make choices in my life every day that will contribute to me ending up in that destination again or could help me avoid being in that destination again. And I have to be very conscious about that. Kind of back to your idea of, of health and all the areas of health. And part of looking at the journey I find is really about your awareness, right? So the more awareness you build, the more you're able to make choices that um, are, are more helpful for you. And the more and more you're aware, the more and more you're learning about yourself, it's, it's easier to know what choices are good for you that you might not have known before. Yes. The wisdom of age, I think, is part of that too. Yes, for sure. <laughs> okay, Christine. So tell us, what is your untold story all about? So, you know, I think that the untold story in the background of my life is uh, that as a child, my parents divorced. And, you know, that is not, you know, as we were talking earlier, not an uncommon story. So, you know, divorce happens in a lot of people's lives. Um, you know, given we're a podcast, not visual, um, you know, I'll share I'm in my mid 50s now. So when my parents made the decision to separate and divorce, divorce was not common. And in fact, I was the first person who in our neighborhood, which when you're, a, you know, I, I was a child, I was about eight or nine at the time. Um, I was the first person in our neighborhood that uh, had ever had parents that had separated or had parents that divorced. I was the only person I knew that had ever had parents that had gone through that. So there was this, uh, it was the 70s. There was this sort of stigma associated with my parents. You know, the, the terminology was the marriage had failed, right? And so there was this sense of failure around their marriage. But I think it, it I interpreted that as well, that our family had failed. And, uh, you know, we weren't strong enough to all stay together. And, you know, when I talk about my own life, you know, I will share with people, you know, yes, my parents are divorced and they both remarried and I have this, you know, huge extended family because of, uh, you know, remarriage and stepbrothers and stepsisters. Mm -hmm. But the untold story behind that is that the, the breakdown of our family unit resulted in me really struggling. I, I, I don't tell that part of the story to, to many people at all. 
and uh, even I think there are members of my own family, my own immediate family, who don't either were too young to remember or have chosen to kind of pack it away and not talk about it, uh, the impact that it had on my life. When you had this experience of your parents' divorce, you said you were about nine years old? Yeah, I would have been, uh, it would have been the summer I was turning 10. So I was nine and uh, turning 10. And so with that breakdown uh, in that family unit, you had impact. So what sort of impact did you have? How did it show up for you? So the, you know, the, the, the logistics of the divorce resulted in me uh, and my two sisters moving out of our family home and Mm -hmm. staying in the neighborhood, but not in the immediate neighborhood where we'd grown up. Uh, We were able to stay in the same schools, et cetera. But for me, the, the way that it manifested was uh, I, I had been a really social kid. Like I think, I I don't think I would ever have been the most outgoing kid in the, on the block, but I was a social kid, ran with the crowd and, uh, had, had strong friendships, but I found myself isolated away from the people that I was closest to, you know, the kids next door and the kids across the street and what would have been my support network at that time. And as well, I just, it happened over a summer and when September came and it was time to go to school, I just could not get up out of bed and go to school. Um, if I if I did get up, I, and I'd go to school, but I'd find an excuse to leave school. You know, I'd fake illness or or tell the teachers I wasn't feeling well so I could go home. Um, and that was back to a house where there was nobody there because my mother had had started working. Um, and that continued for a few weeks and then i was i was literally just not going to school i was i was not getting out of bed until 10 or 11 in the morning after everybody else had got up and done their morning routine and i would just sit and watch game shows in the morning and soap operas in the afternoon and my mother would come home from work and the evening activities would start but i just didn't go to school for a long period of time now you had other you have other siblings you mentioned right so i do now how did how did your siblings cope with this like were you all coping the same way or or um, did anyone notice like i mean you weren't going to school so how did that all come to be like in terms of i guess was your um, were your parents aware that something was not right like how what kind of support did you get so I guess siblings and parents would have had different reactions. So uh, I have an older sister and she's two years older than I am. And her, uh, I think her experience of the divorce was, it was almost a relief. So she was a little more conscious of the conflict between my parents just because of her age. Um, And, you know, I think it's not uncommon, but she kind of took one side over another, you know, Uh, took my mom's side. And so for her, the separation between my mom and my dad was, was a relief. It was easier for her. So I think that she, you know, she was in a happier space herself. And so she would look at my reaction. And I can clearly remember one time I was so upset that I, I decided to write a letter to both of my parents. And, you know, I very carefully copied it out in two copies (laughs) days before you know, having a printer in your house where you could just hit print two copies. Um, right. I remember very carefully, you know, as a 10 year old writing this letter out and then writing an, another copy of it to go to my dad and um, my sister saying, you can't send that. You can't get in the, in the middle of this. Like this is, it, your feelings don't matter mm-hmm. in this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of telling me to tear it up, telling me to put it away. So she was in a different space. My younger sister is three years younger than I am. So she was only, you know, I think, six and a half or seven at the time. And I don't think at that age she had any sense of what right. was going on with me. You know, she she just knew I was unhappy and wasn't my usual self. And uh, we were pretty close. But, she, you know, she was just one of those siblings that would just kind of be there, you know, cuddle up on the bed with you and read a book or something like that. Yeah. Um. From the parental perspective, my dad was not living with us. So he was, you know, I think coping with his own uh, sense of loss over the family, you know, uh, alone in the family home, which I'm sure was, you know, as I look back as a parent myself now, I think, gosh, that must have been just horrific, you know. Um, And my mom was in the, was deep in the throes of coping with having to run her own life again, you know, not be in a marriage any longer. I'm sure dealing with the stigma of, you know, being a divorced woman um, and trying to get her career on track. 
and I think that that was a lot. And uh, I, I, you know, I don't blame either of my parents for kind of being oblivious to it, but my mother knew something was wrong for sure. She was, both my parents did. And um, it resulted in a, you know, a visit to the family doctor who was, you know, kind of a classic family doctor right out of, you know, TV show, like just a kindly, kindly older guy um, who was a great listener and uh, kind of drew me out a little bit about how I was feeling. And I think he was aware that it was, you know, I don't know if they would have even labeled it depression then that I was down, you know, following, following the, the divorce and the separation and the changes that had gone on in my life. But they decided that they were going to tell the school that it was mono, that I had mono. And so I probably wouldn't be back at school for several months. So I guess mono was the, the best, the best answer. It was the longest duration disease they could come up with without it being something, you know, terminal or fatal right. that uh, would have caused more upset. Okay. So even your GP kind of tucked that mental health component oh, away um, of like not telling or speaking about it. Do you feel like it was due to societal norms at the time? I do. I do. I don't, th- I think that they yeah. worried. Um, it's interesting. I had a visit with my mother very recently and uh, I listened to her language around mental health and um, she worked many as a candy striper. Do you know what candy stripers are? So yes. Little- teenage teenage volunteers in hospitals so she had worked as a candy striper in the early 50s in a mental health institution and you know her own perceptions of mental health were that they were grave and permanent conditions right and did not she probably they probably both agreed that having that type of label on me was not going to be helpful in my life and uh and as a result it was called mono <laughs> I, I giggle about it now, but I, I remember at the time thinking that's not what it is. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Did you feel dismissed or did you feel like no one gets me or did you feel like, oh, I'm so strange or out there that no one really even knows what to say? Like, d- did you have any inkling of what it was that you were going through yourself? I think that I think that I knew that I was deeply sad. Like that was mm-hmm. the way I would have described it at that time, that I was just incredibly sad and, um, you know, I was a very innocent kid. Like I, uh, you know, I, I literally was one of those kids who would, you know, draw pictures of their family and put them on the fridge. You know, there's mom and dad and there's me in the middle between my two sisters, you know, and everybody's a little stick figure holding hands. Like I had a very simplistic view of family and, but really counted on the solidity of that, right? That that was a, a core piece of who I was and, and a core piece of what I wanted in my own life. Like I can remember thinking, Oh, you know, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, my dad was very, uh, I would say he was a real feminist. Actually. He, you know, he wanted us to grow up and have careers and would always say to us, don't be a nurse. You know, if you want to be a nurse, don't be a nurse, be a doctor, you know, like, like don't set your, your, your bar too low just because of gender and things. So he was, he was very progressive in that sense. But I I remember thinking it was the first time I could remember understanding that adults were lying, right? (laughs) Like, like the adult, like the doctor, my mom, even my dad, by not talking about it, they were all lying. And and I guess I kind of got that it was, they were lying on my behalf, but I didn't really understand why, you know, I didn't understand why the lie needed to be there, but, but I was, you know, supposed to keep the lie in place too. Like if my friends ask, say, oh yeah, I have mono. So I can't go to school. So yeah, it was. Uh, that I remember that was kind of a. It, it was very. I guess. I guess in today's terminology, we'd call that stigmatizing, but it. It made me feel. To your question, Salima, it made me feel that the feelings I was having were not legitimate, and that um, you know having a level of sadness around you know, a change in my life that was not within my control was something that I, sh- I was supposed to just buck up and take and and move on as though nothing had happened. And I just wasn't able to do that. Right. So that's a lot as a 10 year old to be sitting there with all of that. How did, uh, did you, now did you only stay at your mom's home or did you end up spending any time at your dad's home Oh yeah, there was. I mean, the my parents were great about, you know, not um, not not fighting out their their divorce in the in the child custody realm. 
Um, that's not to say it was an amicable divorce, but it was, at least they didn't they didn't sort of bar people from you know kids from seeing their other parent or anything like that that you hear such sad stories mm-hmm. about. But um, yeah, we were back and forth. So we we did um, visit my dad every second weekend, and you know shared months and shared you know alternated holidays and all those kinds of things. But in truth, I think in some ways that was almost harder because you know every two weeks I would go back to the house that I'd grown up in, be in the neighborhood with friends that I had grown up with. But everything had changed at the same time. You know, my friends knew that my parents weren't together. They knew on Sunday night I had to leave again. Um, Yeah, it was all, it was just all different. You know, the house looked different, different furniture, different, different things. And of course, my parents' lives were also moving on. So my dad, um, uh, my dad remarried first, and then my, my mom remarried later. So it was, you know, lots of change mm-hmm. came in those, in the 10 years following that. Right. And what was it like being back at your dad's home after, with all of the changes, after the family dynamic changes? How did, how did you cope with that? Well, I think um, initially the back and forth was really difficult because you would be in the space that had, that used to feel like your ultimate sanctuary, right? Your, your family home, as especially when you're a 10 year old, you know, that's, that's mm-hmm. the safest place, you know, um, or, or for me in my growing up was the safest place I knew. I know that's not true for all children. Um, mm-hmm. but it wasn't the same once, once they were separated, you know, that, that structure, that, uh, you know, invisible structure of family was gone. And so it was almost mm-hmm. more painful to be there because, you know, it, I had to leave my dad every Sunday, you know, or every second Sunday, and he was sad, and we were sad, and uh, it, you know, go back to my mom's, and it wasn't that we didn't love my mom, and didn't, I didn't have a good, really, I had a good relationship with my mom, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that void was tough, and I think after two or three years, um, I actually approached my mom about moving back, and saying, you know, could I go and live with dad, and my younger sister, uh, wanted to go with me. So she and I were very close and she said, you know, if Chris wants to go, then I'm going to go too. Um, and I think that must have been incredibly hard for my mom, but I think she knew at that point it was, it was going to be the best thing for me, you know, that that was going to help create some, uh, you know, some comfort, some stability, some, you know, a better balance for me, et cetera. And so I stayed and lived with my dad through uh, the balance of my senior public years and senior public school years and right through high school. And my mom was still in the neighborhood. She was, she stayed close and um, what didn't really sort of leave the neighborhood until after my sister and I were, you know, well into high school and, and then she moved into downtown Toronto. Wow. Okay. So going back to the mono, right? Um, knowing what you, I mean, at the time you knew that what you were feeling and what you were experiencing was not mono. You might not have known specifically that there was a mental health component. Uh, But knowing what you know now in hindsight, would you say that your symptoms might have been consistent with like a depressive episode or? Yeah, I I would. I do think it was a depressive episode. And I think because for a couple of reasons, I mean, one is I acutely remember the deep feelings of sadness. Um, I also remember um, I wanted to be out of it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, intellectually, even as a 10 and 11 year old, I didn't want to be feeling that way, but I couldn't wish myself out of it. And I remember how challenging a feeling that was that I could not, I could not make myself feel better. And, um, I think that, so there was sort of this, this knowledge that I couldn't make myself feel better. And I think the other thing that sort of stands out for me from that time is I remember feeling almost, um, I want to say almost out of body, you know, I can remember sort of sitting back and almost like I was observing myself and saying, huh, you're here on the couch again, you know, and you're watching General Hospital and everybody else is coming home from school and you're here. How, you know, how come we can't get you there? You know, like almost, almost in this observational space about my own life. And, uh, and, and I've had that recur uh, as an adult you know, where I, I, I feel myself, um, you know, having another episode of depression or, or struggling to, to stay out of one. And, and as soon as I, I start to have that feeling, that's a real warning sign for me. Um, anyway, sorry. So I, I kind of jumped ahead, but, um, yeah, looking, 
looking at it now, I don't think we even had the terminology of mental health uh, <laughs> back then. I don't think I knew what depression was, you know, probably the only thing I knew about depression was, you know, that there was this character in the Peanuts cartoons that kind of walked around with a black cloud over his head sometimes. <laughs> And that was the articulation of kind of how I was feeling. Like I really, I really just felt like there was this dark cloud over me a lot of the time and I couldn't, couldn't find my happy anymore. So knowing what you know now and this depressive episode and what you kind of experienced um, as, you know, preteen, young teen, when else did you notice it show up in your life? What other points? It's interesting that, you know, as I, as I sit back and kind of observe my own life, if I looked at it along a timeline, um, I think that I've struggled with that same um, episodic experience a couple of times, and they seem to be related around major changes in my life. And I, Mm -hmm. I mean, I know everybody struggles a little bit when they've got change in their life, but um I struggled um, in my first year of university. So I was, uh, you know, it was a massive change. I went from, Mm -hmm. you know, a small, small town-ish high school where, you know, you knew all, (laughs) everybody in your class and the graduating class very well to a very large university in downtown Toronto and, um, you know, feeling like a a very small fish in a very huge pond and not really having... Uh, social networks and connections there and really struggled in my first year of university. Um, I struggled after the birth of my first son, um, my first child, um, and and absolutely know that it was postpartum depression, but didn't have a doctor who was either savvy enough or um, cared enough to really, you know, to really ask the questions that needed to be asked around how I was coping following his birth. Um, and, and my husband was amazing and, and just kind of stuck with me and, and just kept, kept me sane, uh, during that time. But, um, I look back now and, and recognize that I was, I was deep in the throes of postpartum depression and, um, and it, it was undiagnosed. Um, and, and I, and that was really the last time because I think that, I think that after his birth and, and going through that, I started to see the pattern and and I started to recognize the signs that when I'm in a situation where I I don't have control of the outcome, um, it, it can be a real trigger for me. And, uh, you know, if I think back, the the divorce, I didn't have any control of the, over the outcome of that. The, you know, the, the change in my environment and university, although I'd chosen to go to university, it was... Uh, it actually wasn't the university that was my first choice. I was very much influenced by my dad's uh, uh, saying that that was the best choice for me. I wanted to go to a smaller university where a bunch of my friends had been going and uh, he didn't want me to do that. Um, and then, you know, and obviously the choice to have a child was was absolutely mine, but I think that that was a lot more around uh, hormones and massive change of lifestyle. I'd gone from being an entrepreneur with a really active career to a stay at home mom. And, and just the, that, (laughs) that's like hitting a brick wall, you know, you're in terms of the change to to who you are and what you're doing. Right. Yeah. So it, it really has shown up in different parts of your life. And, you know, once you could start to recognize those signs and patterns, as you mentioned, that you felt were really consistent with what you know now as postpartum, um, after recognizing all of that, recognizing that pattern, I'm curious about, how things showed up for you when you had more awareness? Did anything change? Yeah, for sure. I think that the, I think particularly after the postpartum, um, I, I started to recognize, you know, behaviors that would start to appear for me that uh, were signs. So I'm a, I'm a pretty routine person. Like I, I like order and I like, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not like super rigid, but I do get up at the same time every day. I like, uh, you know, I like to exercise. I like to walk. I like to be with people, etc. And when I'm having, uh, when I'm starting to have sort of episodes emerge, um, I notice I start to shut those things down. So, you know, the sleeping in, the not getting out of bed, not getting out of bed's a big one for me, you know, like wanting to just lie in bed and read a book all day or uh, not engaging in my life. Uh, definitely a sign. Uh, overeating is a big sign for me. So 
um, you know, losing control of my, my capacity to regulate my diet in a healthy way, um, using food as a, as almost a sedative to the emotions that I'm starting to feel, um, you know, eat overeating, eating a lot of sugary food, uh, you know, binging when I was in university, it was binge drinking, um, you know, all, all things that in my mind were sort of, um, you know, behaviors that to me started to, to try and squelch down that feeling of sadness and, uh, and, and aren't healthy ways to squelch down the feeling of sadness. That makes a lot of sense. And that's all of the stuff that you became more aware of, um, in terms of your behaviors when you started to recognize those patterns. And, uh, after your first son, did you have any other children? I did. I have I had a second boy. Um, second boy. Did you experience yeah. anything like your first? I didn't. Um, not to, definitely not to the same degree, but I do think, um, I do think, you know, to, to the, one of the comments you made earlier, you know, the, the understanding of, of the symptoms and what's causing them, mm-hmm. um, you start to become a little bit more resilient and, and your recognition of the symptoms helps, right? It's, uh, so if I would, you know, if I noticed that I was feeling overwhelmed because of the fatigue, because babies take a lot of energy out of you and uh, physically and mentally and the sleep deprivation in particular is tough for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I I think I learned to, first of all, my husband, to talk to my husband about what was going on. So if I'm exhausted to say, listen, I'm exhausted. I just need a nap. You know, like I got to go for 40 minutes. If I go 40 minutes and go lie down, I'm going to be a new woman when I wake up and being able to articulate to your support network around you, what you really need. Um, what I learned that lesson, uh, after the postpartum to really talk to people when you're struggling. Mm -hmm. So who was part of your support system when you had your second child, who was part of that support system? Well, even with my first, so I I would say uh, my mother didn't live in the country. Uh, My mom was in the U.S. at that point. And my my mother-in-law was actually very present. And, um, you know, my husband and I were both new parents with our first one. And, you know, babies can have these crazy hours where they're kind of colicky and challenging. Mm -hmm. And uh, she would just kind of magically appear some nights at sort of 5, 30, 6 o'clock at night and say, you know what, just dropped in to take him for a walk. And and she'd just like take the baby. <laughs> I don't know if my husband, I should ask my husband, I don't know if my husband had shared that that was a particularly difficult time. You know, he was getting home from work. He was tired. I was tired from being with the baby all day and wanted to mm-hmm. hand the baby over to somebody else. And right. he was so tired from his work that uh, that he wasn't always in the best frame of mind to take on a baby who was fussy at that point. But I can remember her just showing up and saying, oh, I just was in the neighborhood. I thought I'd put him in his pram. She was English. You know, I put him in his pram and take him for a walk. And, uh, you know, it was it was a lifesaver. It, it truly was. And she used to joke and talk to me about how it was when she raised her kids and, you know, funny, funny little English things like they would put them in their little prams and their carriages. And she said, you know, we used to put them out at at one o'clock in the afternoon and just give them a little shake until they fell asleep and we'd leave them there sleeping outside in the garden. (laughs) You know, in the modern world, you're like, what? You left a baby in the garden? You know, nobody would do that in the modern world, but it was a different time, right? And it was the fifties, not the, not the twenties or the two thousands. So and all the moms would get together with tea and macaroons. And, you know, and I was just like, well, where was your baby monitor? And there was no baby monitor. You know, they, they didn't right. have that level of attentiveness to the babies. They just trusted that the baby was safe in the pram and that was it. So, right. she, but I think that that was a tremendous support to me. And my mom mm-hmm. was great. Like my mom was not able to be there physically, but she was, uh, mm-hmm. a gr- she's a great, she was and is a great grandma and was very mm-hmm. uh, supportive and, and very good at sort of saying, listen, you can't take on the world. Like you've got to just, just take care of the baby. If the laundry piles up, the laundry piles up, don't worry about it. And uh, trying to talk me out of my, my uh, natural desire to want everything to be perfect all the time. Mm-hmm. And did you have different medical support the second time around? I did. I did have a better doctor. Um, better pediatrician by then I had a good relationship with a pediatrician as well who um 
uh, had had became our pediatrician when we had our first, when he was about a year old. And then uh, when we had our second son, we had, we continued to see that same pediatrician and he was smart. Like he, he knew that women struggled. He could tell, um, you know, he knew my first wasn't even sleeping through the night yet mm-hmm. by the time I had my second. Um, and, you know, was just very compassionate, very normalizing, you know, that every kid's different. You don't have to, your kids don't have to be doing what other kids are doing around sleep, but, you know, try this, try that. He was, and he checked in a lot, like with moms. Mm -hmm. I found when we went in for our regular checkups with the kids, he would be checking in with the moms. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that was, you know, society becoming more aware, the medical Mm -hmm. community becoming Mm -hmm. more aware that, Mm -hmm. that women struggle. There had been a really sad situation with postpartum depression in between my first and second children where um, a woman died by suicide um, with her baby. And I think that it really shook not only the, you know, the, the people of our city, but it, but it also, it really shook, I think, medical practitioners who worked with moms um, and kind of made them pay attention. You know, don't, don't assume somebody's okay. And how were you impacted? How were you impacted by that story when, when that happened in your community? Yeah, it made me really sad. I mean, it happened. I guess it happened just after I'd had my second, and and so, you know, having been through the experience of postpartum, having you know come through it, and then having my second with me, I was just I I I just felt so sad for for her for her family. Um, because I was very conscious that, you know, kind of there, but for the grace of God, go I, you know, was one thought I had. But the other thought I had was that, was how much she was going to miss, you know, that, that when you're in that, when you're that, when you're feeling that depressed, it's like being in a room and all the curtains are drawn and you can't figure out how to open the curtains and you don't even have the will to open the curtains. And, um, you know, and I thought, you know, that if there was a way to guide somebody around how to open the curtains, she could see out the window and see, this isn't how it's going to be forever. This is, this is just right now. And your life is going to be good. And your relationship with your children is going to be fantastic. And there's going to be so many moments of joy in, in raising them. Um, and I just thought how sad it was that she wasn't going to see that. What um, did after hearing that story, after living through that and experiencing that sadness, did anything emerge differently for you after that? I started paying attention to all the joyous moments. Uh, my husband t- used to tease me um, that every day he'd come home from work and I'd tell him funny stories about the kids and what they'd been up to that day and, you know, who put spaghetti on their head and, uh, you know, all the silly little moments that are are, are part of parenting. And... Uh, and he really encouraged me. I'd always, I'd always written a journal. I'd always, um, I'd, I'd published a few short stories and things like that. And he said, you know, you really should write some of this stuff down because, you know, parents would enjoy it. Like there's a real commonality to parenting and, you know, you see it, parents standing around at the playground or at the waiting pool or, you know, in the balcony and watching their kids at swimming lessons and sharing the funny moments. And, um, so I, I did start writing. I wrote a few columns um, that were picked up by, yeah, by our local newspaper. Um, and it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek column called Life on the Life on the Child Side instead of Life on the Wild Side, kind of like you gave up the wild side in favor of being a parent. Um, and, and it ran in our local newspaper, the Beach Metro News, for almost 10 years. Actually, it ran until my kids could read because <laughs> When they were at the capacity that they could read the column, they started to realize that I was splashing their lives all over a, a, a local newspaper with 33,000 readers, and they weren't very happy about that. So <laughs> once they could read, I kind of got banned from uh, from telling anybody about their lives. But um, but it was extremely therapeutic for me. And, uh, you know, I didn't just write about all the funny moments. I mean, a lot of them are very poignant moments um, that have sadness in them, you know, like losing, losing grand, losing grandparents and, um, you know, kids moving on from stages in their lives that, you know, that are, are wonderful stages, but everybody grows up, you know, they're not toddlers anymore and they lose their teeth and they, and they move on and they move away from you as a parent and just helped me to kind of process that stuff, but kind of process it with a community of other parents. 
I'm sure it was so well received and I'm sure it was quite valuable to many parents. It sounds like you had a lot of fun with it too, which is the best part. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Christine, you know, when people come to see me in the therapy room, um, individuals typically, um, you know, they're usually in one of three places when they're embarking on any part of any particular part of their healing journey. And I don't mean overall, like the journey of life, but in a particular area that they're working on. And so some people, when they come to me, they're at the beginning stages where they have no idea where to start or they know they need to get started um, somewhere or they're in the middle. They're like right in the thick of things. It's a current right now problem that's happening or they're looking back, maybe looking for closure or looking for introspection or looking for a way to make peace um, in a way that they can move forward. Um, So what part of the journey would you say that you were in? Would you say that you are getting started in the middle or looking back? Well, I'm sure from the discussion today, it would sound like I'm looking back, but I actually... I don't make assumptions. That's why I'm asking about all three stages. (laughs) I think I'm I'm kind of in the later stages of that middle stage. The The only reason I say that is that I think it would be the ultimate arrogance to say that I'm never going to be faced with this again. I really do think that depression is like a town that I keep circling back to. <laughs> um, you know, like I, I, I move away and then I come back sometimes. And mm-hmm. okay. it's not that it's always bad because I think there's always learning that comes out of it. I think there's always mm-hmm. um, a moment of self-awareness for me that that there's something going on in my life mm-hmm. that I don't feel in, in control of and that that's what's making me feel unwell. Um kind of like you recognize you've got a cold, you know, you've got a sore throat and runny eyes and a runny nose and you suddenly say, oh, look, I've got a cold. I, you know, I'll have those moments occasionally. And, and I think that I just recognize them. So it's like you have symptoms of what you know now is, is, you know, symptoms of depression. So you know that you have these things and it's like, okay, so what do I, what are the things that I need to do to keep this under control, to manage it, to to be able to keep functioning. Exactly. And I do think of it almost like a cold, you know, Mm -hmm. like if you, if you know you have all these symptoms and you don't take care of yourself, Mm -hmm. it just gets worse. Mm -hmm. And then you end up with bronchitis or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to pay attention to uh, the early symptoms and I, and I try to treat them. You know, I, if, if it's something that I can change in the structure of my life, Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take the steps to change it. If it is something that I can't change and I'm just going to have to live through Mm -hmm. then, you know, like, uh, my, my mother-in-law having cancer, Mm -hmm. um, you know, then I will, I'll just make sure that I've got good health practices Mm -hmm. in place, not just for my mental health, but my physical health, my social health, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, sometimes it's financial health, you know, Mm -hmm. people have financial challenges too. So I just try to build those pieces in. And I, and I really do think that social health is a huge part of that. So, having people you can talk to, whether it's, you know, whether it's a professional, a clinician, somebody in an EAP, um, you know, friends to me have been huge, you know, and, and, and friends that have known you for a long time and can support you in a positive way and, and family too. And my family is tremendously supportive. Right. And so on that note, what is your key message to the listeners of the show? First of all, you're, you're braver than you think you are. Um, you know, and you, you have deeper capacity than, then I think we all have deeper capacity than we give ourselves credit for. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're, you're going to be okay as long as you remember that this is a journey, that there's going to be hills and there's going to be valleys. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the valleys don't go forever and the hills don't last forever either. So, you know, mm-hmm. the, you can have a great view at the top, but, you know, there's probably still stuff to learn at the, in the valley as well. Um, and just keep going, mm-hmm. like, just keep going. You put one foot in front of the other, you keep going mm-hmm. and you, ask for help when you need it. Awesome. I love the analogy with the hills and the valleys. I'm going to steal that one again. Another one of your points I'm stealing. (laughs) Okay. I'm curious, what was game changing for you in terms of inspiration that perhaps um, reflects your untold story? Is there like an event, a book, a quote, a mantra, something that kind of helped to anchor you? You know what? I've been inspired by a lot of people in my life. And um, I, I kept thinking about other people that I knew had survived worse things than I had. (laughs) And that was what inspired me. Um, I thought about my grandmother who lived in London with two young children um, during World War II, you know, and didn't know where her husband was, didn't know if he was alive or dead. 
uh, and had to go on every day, um, you know, one foot in front of the other, dealing with whatever was going on in the society in London. Um, and every night bombs falling on their heads. And I, you know, I'd go to bed every night during COVID going, there's no bombs falling on my head, you know, like I'm safe, like where I am right now, I'm safe. I just have to keep that in mind. Um, I think that, uh, I, I, in my, in my work, I've had the tremendous good fortune to meet so many inspiring people who have struggled with mental health and, you know, to your point, have, have dared to share their story, whether they're peer supporters or whether they are uh, Paralympians or they are um, just people that I work with every day, you know, clinicians and colleagues who are, are in the business of helping other people every day because they themselves have struggled. And um, I, I find that very inspiring. So, you know, there's no like one big celebrity that I look at and think fantastic. It's, it's really people in regular people in my life. Okay. So what's a cause or organization that has been impactful to you on your journey that you would like to give a shout out to? Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to my colleagues at uh, mm -hmm. what used to be Morneau Chappelle is now called LifeWorks. Mm -hmm. um, so many people that I've learned so much from uh, clinicians and peers. Um, I think in this time of COVID, I also be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to the um, frontline and, and first responders that I know have, have really been up against it. And I, I personally get a lot of support out of um, uh, Weight Watchers. So they're no WW is what they call themselves now, but I think that they, um, for me, have really embodied uh, you know, really the concept of taking care of your whole self. It's not, you know, not just about food. So for me, food is not, <laughs> food isn't an addiction. It's, it, it's a mechanism I use to, to soothe myself. And uh, they really focus on making sure that you're, as a human being, that you're well, that you're taking care of yourself psychologically as well as physically. And uh, that's been very helpful to me. Okay. So what are your social handles? If someone wants to connect with you, if people want to connect with you, how can they? Yeah, for sure. Easiest one for sure is LinkedIn. Okay. So, you know, that that's definitely the space where from a, you know, from a professional, but also a personal perspective, I, I often post about, uh, you know, mental health things that I think are going to be helpful for people. Um, Any other platforms? Uh, I do. Uh, also, on, I'm on Instagram and Facebook, so people are welcome to connect with me on both of those if they want to. Instagram, you're going to see a lot of pictures of my puppy. So, you know, just be warned, he's also part of the mental health package. And um, yeah, so those are the ones that I would say are the most. Uh, okay. And we'll grab those um, handles from you. Sure. So the show notes page will have all of the details for people to, to link and get connected. With Sounds you. great. For sure. Okay. So Christine, guess what? Guess what? What? <laughs> <laughs> you have just dared yourself to share. Congratulations, Christine. Well, I feel like See, I'm going to date myself. I feel like evil Knievel. Can I get a can I get an outfit and a motorcycle now? <laughs> Absolutely. Let's try and arrange that. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, I I just want to say thank you. It's a, it's a tremendous honor to be asked and uh and I'm really grateful for the time that you put into this. I, I'm sure you're helping a lot of people, Salima, by sharing uh other people's stories. Thank you, Christine. It actually means quite a bit to me. I'm I'm that you you say those kind words and share that uh, with me. In fact, I'm grateful for how you showed up with your daredevil energy and speaking so genuinely about how mental health has shown up throughout your life and how you've combated it, worked with it, and, you know, really transformed your life and taken other struggles and created transformation. And, and it's just so beautiful to see how it has transpired for you. And talking about for what some may consider as a common struggle, um, it really needed to be told, Christine, because it's these very stories that don't get told, they get missed. So once again, Christine, thank you for being part of Dare to Share Your Untold Story and helping to be a voice in breaking down the barriers of mental stigma. To all of our listeners, if you like what you've been hearing on this podcast and you want to be part of breaking down barriers of mental stigma, I invite you to go wherever you are listening to the episode and hit subscribe. Leave us a comment or a review of the episode and maybe how you relate to it. To learn more about what we offer, visit 
www.daretoheal.co. And if you are feeling ready and brave to share, please submit your story by visiting www.daretoshare.co. Thanks for joining in.